السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن اهتدى بهدا ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمد عبده ورسوله اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وارزقنا فهم النبيين وحفظ المرسلين اللهم افتح إلينا حكمتك وانشر علينا رحمتك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام وصل اللهم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله الكرام ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي الرضيم بسم الله Our topic now in the last two chapters that remain pertain one hadith one single hadith and it is known as the hadith of tamim ad-dari so this is going to be our analysis of this hadith but we are not yet going to be talking about the dajjal yet i have parted this into two chapters and my methodology here is to examine two characters in particular two characters so this first chapter here chapter 13 this session we are going to be looking at the first character and then in the next session we'll be looking at the other character so you can see that the the title of the chapter is the island and the spy the island and the spy now i want you to do some reading on this matter here from page 223 all the way up until Mm, 225 to 26. Read that disposition there, a brief disposition, a background on the science of hadith, because you have to be very careful, as we said before, when you're going into the hadith sciences. But more importantly, I need you to understand, and those who are maybe watching this um, as it's being posted, on what's termed very, very commonly used as an excuse when people fail to understand the contents of hadith like this, they use the term problematic hadith. Now problematic hadith is, is a technical term in the sciences of hadith, but you can't use that as an excuse. And what we say is that the hadith is not problematic. It is your understanding of the hadith that's problematic. And I am going to prove it to you as we go through the study of this hadith inshallah ta'ala. So, what is the hadith of Tamim al-Dari? The hadith of Tamim al-Dari pertains an event that occurred during the Prophet's lifetime, which Tamim al-Dari, having experienced this event, then came to the Prophet wasallam and then narrated it to him. So this is not an event that the Prophet encountered. It is an event that Tamim al-Dari encountered. Now it's not known chronologically when the event itself took place. But it happened during this latter portion of the Prophet's mission, yani during the Madini period after the Hijrah. What is known, however, is that Tamim Dari narrated the event in the ninth year of Hijrah, in the Madini period when he came to the Prophet wasallam to accept Islam. So he, this is an event that, that may have taken place long before Tamim al-Dari, who was a sea voyager. And these were merchants, they crossed to the seas to go and trade in different places. So this is an event that took place, he encountered it. And then maybe there are two opinions here. One is that years later, him and his tribe came to the Prophet Sallallahu to accept Islam. And then Tamim al-Dari told the Prophet Sallallahu Oh, and I wanted to tell you something else that happened with me some time back. Maybe it's of some benefit or something. The second opinion is that this event took place and Tamim al-Dari encountered it. And then on his return journey, he went immediately, crossed the desert, went straight to the Prophet Sallallahu in Medina accepted Islam and then told the Prophet what happened. So there are two opinions. One that it happened very long before, then Tamim Adari came and afterwards, after a few years maybe, okay, and then narrated it. The second is that it happened and then he immediately went and he accepted Islam. So this is the key determinant here. He accepted Islam during this narration. 
during this narration, which means prior to this, prior to him narrating it to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was a, he was a Christian. He was a Christian. Keep this in mind, hold this thought. <clears throat> it is also evident from many of the other relative events that took place in and around that time period when it became manifestly apparent, it became more than evident that these Jews, the rabbinic order in particular, were not going to accept Islam. They were not going to accept Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Many other things also happened in that at that time period. Many of the Shari aspects were changed or established, like the Qibla was established, changed from Jerusalem to Mecca. The fasting was changed because they used to follow the fasting that the Jews had. Fasting was also changed. The punishment for adultery was changed. Many things were changed from changed meaning Naskh. It was abrogated from the, from the traditional Sharia that the Prophet had, had, had continually adapted, which was in the Torah. Now something new was established. In other words, now that the Jews have made it clear, we don't want to follow you. Then now it's up to you. Let them do what they want to do. Now this is the path that you're going to follow, is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordained for, that, for the Muslims. So we said before in the previous sessions, what did we discuss? We said what? In, the, in, the, in Surah Al-Isra, Asa Rabbukum an yarhamakum. It may be that your Lord still has mercy on you. Means He's giving you one more opportunity to redeem yourselves. And we say that redemption is what the Jews was for the Jews, salvation was for the Christians, and submission was for the Arabs and the Muslims. Redemption was for the Jews. And this is how they were supposed to redeem themselves, by, by pledging their allegiance to the Prophet ﷺ, which they refused. And therefore, the release of the Dajjal was contingent on this pivotal moment. Remember we spoke about pivotal moments? In the first session, I believe I, I said this. There was a pivotal moment at the time of Nabi Isa. That was a pivotal moment for them. Had they accepted Jesus, history would have taken another course, but they didn't. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them one more opportunity, one more chance before he decided finally to release the Dajjal. And that was incumbent on Nabi Muhammad's arrival at Medina and the Jews, the stance that the Jews are going to take. And this is a phenomenal event at that time because all of creation was watching. Everyone in the heavens and the earth were watching. I don't mean literally, I'm saying that metaphorically. Everyone was waiting to see because the Jews are the ones who had been talking and talking for centuries when they established themselves in Medina. Why were they in Medina in the first place? Because they, they, they knew it. it was in their scriptures, they had affirmed it, that a prophet would be sent to them who would be their redeemer. And they were telling the Arabs this for a very long time. Oh, you're looking down upon us. Wait until our, our redeemer comes. Wait until the prophet comes. He will come to Medina. And so now here is Nabi Muhammad approaching the gates of Medina with Abu Bakr by his side. And all of Medina is watching and waiting to see what's going to happen. Will the Jews accept him or not? And remember what we also said, many of the Jews accepted him. They fulfilled that end because they knew what was in the scripture and they accepted that. But it was the, the higher, the elites, the rabbinic order who said, we are not going to bend a knee. We are not going to bend a knee. And they plotted against him as well. They did. There were a lot of assassination attempts. Allah protected his messenger. Allah protected his messenger. There were a lot of assassination attempts. And not just assassination attempts. They tried to, you know, cause a lot of fitna in, in Medina. They tried to upset the governing system that, that Rasulullah had maintained. They tried to bring in political discord. They tried to get the tribes to clash with one another. They did a lot. So we say that the release of the Dajjal was incumbent upon the collective decision of the Jews. Similar to their collective decision 
upon or of choosing to accept or reject Nabi Isa alayhi salam. And this is why we say that the messianic concept does not pertain the Muslims at the core. Muslims are affiliated with it. Yes, we are. It, it touches us as well, but it doesn't pertain Muslims at the core. At the very core, it deals with the Christians and the Jews. And this is now why you understand the wisdom behind this matter. Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala choose a Christian man to go and find this island where the Jal has been chained? Why wouldn't it have been a Muslim? Why a Christian man? That's very interesting, isn't it? Why is it a Christian has been chosen for that mission? <laughs> now, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there are actually two hadith I'm going to use. And they're both the same hadith, just different narrations. One hadith is in the Sunan of, uh, it is in the Sunan of Abu Dawood. It's in the Sunan of Abu Dawood. Says, it's also been narrated by Fatima bin Qais. Both the hadith have been narrated by Fatima bin Qais. أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أخر العشاء أخر العشاء الآخرة ذات الليلة ثم خرج فقال إنه فقال إنه حبسني حديث كان يحدثونه كان يحدثونه تميم الدار عن رجل كان في جزيرة من جزائر البحر فإذا رجل يجر شعره مسلسل في الأغلال ينزو فيما بين السماء وبين السماء والأرض. The reason I use this hadith here is for two things to highlight two things. One is this phrase ينزو فيما بين السماء والأرض. The second is to show you what was the more uh, if you want to zero in and say what are, what are the micro events taking place as this narration was being given by the Prophet So the Messenger of Allah had delayed the Isha prayer one night. When he when he then came out, he said, I was delayed by what Tamim Dari was saying to me. I was delayed by what he was saying to me about what he saw when he went on this voyage. So you, you see here, there's something that is taking place in the background. It's not just random. It's not just whatever. The Prophet Sallallahu delayed the Aisha prayer, so everybody was waiting for him while he was still inside and Tamim Dari and they had already accepted Islam. Now Tamim Dari is giving this narration to the Prophet Sallallahu and he was delayed by this. Why was he delayed? Because the Prophet Sallallahu was verifying what Tamim Dari said. And this we will affirm in the next hadith we will look at. The phrase here that he uses is very interesting. He says, Yanzu fima bayna samai wal ard. In reference to what he saw, the man who was chained. He was shifting or leaping between the stratas and the material realm. Bayna sama, between the sama and the ard. He, he was constantly oscillating between the two. And we are going to look at this term yanzu, what is what what it means. What does it mean he's shifting between the stratas? Now, some of the narrations say that he Rasulullah, then when he came out and then they performed the salah, he then took to the mimbar. وَسَعِدَ الْمِنْبَرَ وَكَانَ لَا يَسْعَدُ عَلَيْهِ قَبْلَ ذَلِكَ إِلَى يوم إِلَّا يَوْمِ الْجُمْعَةِ فَاشْتَدَّ ذَلِكَ عَلَى النَّاسِ فَمِنْ بَيْنِ قَائِمٍ وَجَالِسٍ فَأَشَارَ إِلَيْهِمْ بِيَدِهِ أَنِقْعُدُوا So what he did was that he ascended the member and according to what's being narrated here and this, this statement is in the Sunan of Ibn Majah uh, Sorry, yeah, he ascended the mimbar and the one who, the, the people who are narrating this say that he had never done this before except on Yomul Jum'ah. So he didn't really go up the mimbar uh, regularly to give, to give a khutbah. Now this was Isha. So here now people are wondering what's going on. And, and, and so he told the people to settle down because they were astonished by this. They were like, what's going on? Is there something happening? You see, so he told them, he indicated with his hand. 
you know sit down it's okay it's fine he gestured to them to sit down so something is happening here he's he's drawing their attention it's being given some it's being given uh, paramount importance he, so he's he doesn't want to just narrate this to just a few handful of companions who are there with him or something like that he wants the entire population that is ava- uh, that is there in the masjid to hear what he has to say so what did he do falamma qada rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam salatuhu jalasa ala al minbar wa huwa yadhaku so then he sat down he finished his prayer and then he sat on the minbar and then he smiled at them so relax chill don't worry there's something i want to tell you but relax faqala liyalzam kullu insanin musallat he said it's important that every individual sit where they are because people are standing up and they were going to leave <laughs> so he draws back their attention no no i want you guys to sit down sit down and listen to this ثم قال اتدرون لما جمعتكم do you know why i have collected you why i have told you to gather and sit this is again look at the etiquette of the sahaba look at their their humble their humility قالوا قالوا الله ورسوله اعلم we don't know we can guess but we are not going to do that we don't know you tell us so he said inni wallahi ma jama'tukum li raghbatin wala li rahbatin i did not gather you here for exhortation or for a warning of any of any such thing and he took an oath by allah it's not 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 for any of that matter walakin jama'tukum li anna tamim ad-dari kana rajulan nasraniyan faja'a fabaya'a wa aslama وحدثني حديثا وافق الذي كنت احدثكم عن مسيح الدجال rather i gathered you all here today because of what tamim ad-dari who was this man a christian man and he came to me and he accepted islam and then he narrated something to me that confirms so there was something he, he this is why he got delayed He was confirming what Tamim Ad-Dari was telling him. So he's telling the the the, the Sahaba as well. I've conf- I verified this. It confirms what I have been telling you all this time regarding the one-eyed imposter, Al-Masih Ad-Dajjal. So what did he say then? Now the narration begins. and the prophet is narrating him hadathani he narrated to me annahu rakiba fi safinatin yah bahriyatin ma'a 30 rajulan min lakhm wa judam wa judama falaiba bihim al mawju shahran fi al bahri so he narrated to me that he was on a vessel or a ship in the sea for with about 30 men 30 others from the tribes of banu lakhm and banu judam now banu lakhm and banu judam were also christian tribes the banu judam were levant arabs during the byzantine era the byzantine rule of jerusalem the holy land and they were essentially christian up until the battle of yarmouk this was after the prophet had passed away sallallahu alaihi wasallam And then they when they were defeated in the battle of Yarmouk they they the whole tribe accepted Islam. They had close ties with the Banu Lakhm and are descendants of the Qahtani Arabs but from the Iraqi descent but so the Qahtani Arabs are originally from the Yemeni origin but then you know they migrated northwards. So the Banu Lakhm are from the Iraqi descent of the uh, Qahtani Arabs. and and tamim ad-dari from the house of ad-dar this was his his family are from the lakhmite origin of this of this lineage so thumma arfa'u ila jaziratin fi al-bahri hatta maghrib al-shams fajalasu fi aqrub fi fi aqrub as-safinati fadakhalu al-jazirata 
فلقيتهم دابة أهلب كثير الشعر لا يدرون ما قبله من دبره من كثرة الشعر So they were on this ship فلعب بهم الموج They were tossed about by a wave Now here موج is wave Literal translation But موج actually means like a storm A hurricane for about a month, they were they were tossed about by this storm, and then they landed on an island just offshore. So they took a smaller boat, and because they saw land, having just gone through a storm, they took a small boat and they went ashore to see maybe they could find some salvage or something, some help. I mean, the ship must have been damaged. So they went off, and when they landed on the shores, they met what now he describes upon seeing the first time. A dab, a dab, a beast. They saw a beast. I'm going to explain this in a bit. They saw a beast with so much hair, so hairy, that they could not tell its front from its rear because of how hairy it was. They wouldn't, they didn't know, like, so they didn't know. It had no face. They didn't know if they were talking to its face or its backside or whatever. They didn't know. Now, one of the reasons why this hadith has been classified as problematic by some of these very highly educated ulama is because of the storm. They believe that storms cannot last for one month. That just doesn't make any sense to them. Well, if you do a bit of scientific study, if you study a little bit, you will find that there actually have been storms documented over the last 60, 70 years since meteorology gained some uh, advancement in technology. There have been storms that have been documented that have lasted for 30 days, some even 40 days. And you can look this up. In 1994, there was a storm just off the Eastern Pacific Ocean that lasted for 30 calendar days. 30 days. And it had traveled over 8,000 miles. 8,000 miles this storm had traveled. A storm typically can last anywhere from an hour to 200 hours if it hits land. If it hits land, it wouldn't last longer than that. And this is because the storm's fuel is water. <laughs> so if it is a storm at sea and it's constantly getting this warm moisture and air pulling up water, it's feeding the storm. You see, so it can last for days and days and days until it runs out of juice. Another storm was the Atlantic hurricane of 1971. And that lasted for 27 days. Recently, well, I don't know how recent we could regard this is 20 years ago, 2000, no, sorry, 10 years ago. 2012, another storm, an Atlantic cyclone, lasted 22 days. So yes, storms can last for a month. Don't call the hadith problematic. The problem is you. The hadith. problem is not the hadith. The problem is you. You don't want to do your homework. You don't want to do your study, and then you don't understand what the hadith is saying, and then you want to conclude and say hadith is problematic. Hadith is not problematic. You are problematic. <laughs> now this gives validity to an interesting theory. And this is the theory that my one of my teachers, Sheikh Imran Hussein, proposes about this regarding the island of Dajjal. Okay? That the island of Dajjal is symbolic as the island of, of Britain. Now, you have to understand here how Sheikh Imran speaks. He's not saying, and he has also said this a number of times literally, in, and you will see it in his books. He's not saying it's literally the island of Dajjal. He's not saying literally. He's saying this is symbolic. It's symbolically the island of the Dajjal because what he's doing, the methodology he's applying is in interpreting certain elements in the Hadith. And because this is something that's not occurring in our time and space. And I'm going to explain that. And there's a whole disposition here about interdimensionality. It's not occurring in our time and space. Let's understand that at least. Many of the scholars, the ulama have said that this is a vision. It's a ru'ya. It's a ru'ya. Because Dajjal is not in our biological time and space. We have already discussed this. 
So there are symbolic elements to be interpreted here. And so Sheikh Imran has interpreted certain symbolic elements such as the monastery, okay, such as the godlessness, a lot of things which now, if you look back in history, you will find that the Western world, Western civilization actually began right after the Prophet ﷺ passed away. And it started from Britain and, 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 and Britain just expand onwards after that. This is why he is using this analogy. He's saying that this would be the island. This storm, the documentation of such a storm, such as the, the one in 1994 uh, that traveled 8,000 miles, that's a very long distance. Now that bears some plausibility that this island could possibly not have been in the Mediterranean where these voyages were, were more common amongst the trades the trades that the, the Arabs would do across the Mediterranean, like with the, uh, they had a trading post in Venice, for example. So, you know, they would go even as far as that to trade. Some would go all the way to the Straits of Gibraltar to trade. It's possible that this storm carried them way across the Mediterranean and into the Atlantic and all the way to the British Isles. It's possible. I'm saying it's possible, but even then, this is not my interpretation. It's not my interpretation. My interpretation is not with regards to the physical, biological, as for the physical, geological island location. I'm not interested in that. And you can see, you will see my methodology here. I've made it very clear. I'm not interested in knowing where the island is. And people should not really be interested in knowing where the island is. The physical location doesn't matter. This physical location was at that time, 1400 years ago. Now, if you're assuming the Jal is still locked away, then yeah, you can go and sit on Google Maps and find the island if you want, if you have enough time to do that, okay? And, and I think people, unfortunately, they have too much time on their hands to do all those things. You can sit on Google Maps, figure it out. We are not focused with the island, the physical island or the physical elements here. Even my inclusion of the, of giving explanation of the storm here was just to clarify what some of these people say about problematic hadith because they've used the storm as a problem. They can't understand how a storm could last that long. And their conclusion is hence, oh, it's problematic. No. That's why I've included that. Our focus here is to analyze two characters, two characters, the Jassasa and the Dajjal. That's our focus here. So let's move on now that that's clarified. So when they saw this thing, they said, Faqalu, Wailaki, ma anti, what are you? War unto you, what are you? Faqalat, ana al jasasa, I am the jasasa. Qalu, wa ma al jasasa, what is the jasasa? Could you explain that to us at least? What did it say? Qalat, ayuha al qawm, intaliku ila hadha al rajul, fi dayr. فَإِنَّهُ إِلَىٰ خَبَرِكُمْ بِالْأَشْوَاقِ Look at what it did. Look at what it did. Do you see? We are looking at the, we are doing a linguistic analysis here. We are trying to analyze what kind of speech this is. Who's, who talks like this? They asked it, what are you? They didn't ask, who are you? When you ask who, you're asking for a name. When you ask what, you're asking for the categorization of that object. So if I ask you, what are you? You will say, I'm a man. If I, <laughs> see, understand? But if I ask you, who are you? You will say, I'm Abdullah. So they, they, they're asking, what are you? They don't want to know who this person is because it's not a person. You can't even figure out what this person is. Like there's so much hair, we don't know front from back. And so it says, I am the Jasasa. Now we are going to look linguistically at what this means. The Jasasa. Then they asked, what is the Jasasa? Now, if they already knew the word in the Arabic language as Jasa, why did they ask, what is the Jasasa? It implies here, therefore, that this doesn't make sense to them. They have never heard such a word being used in such a sense. But when they asked for a clarification, Wama al Jasasa, what is the Jasasa? It didn't respond to them. It did not respond to them. Instead, it deflected the question and led them elsewhere. Oh, people, go 
proceed towards that man who is in the monastery. For indeed, he is eager to hear from you. قَالَ لَمَّا سَمَّتْ لَنَا رَجُلًا فَرِقْنَا مِنْهَا أَنْ تَكُونَ شَيْطَانًا when it spoke of a man, we immediately departed from it. For we were afraid that it might be a shaitan, it might be a demon. Isn't that interesting? When they first saw it, they called it a beast, a daba. Now they're calling it a shaitan. What's going on? What's, what's happening here? Why, why, is, why is the terminology changing? The word Daba has got many meanings, all of which pertain beast or something that is bestial. The word, the, the, the root word Dab, Dab is a bear as a noun. And Dabba can mean uh, something that's creeping or crawling. And the variant Dab, Dab means reptile or something that's reptilian in nature. Now without the Shitta, Daba, Daba. It is a verb that means to be worn out, which then branches off from a different root word, Dawaba, which means to wear out or to ruin. This latter term supports the former term as a beast with a characteristic of ruination or destruction. You understand what I'm saying? However, the contextual meaning of the word cannot be beast for four reasons. I've highlighted four reasons and maybe you can analyze this and you can come up with more reasons, but I've got four reasons here. First of all, in the narration, Tamim Dari first called it a beast, Daba, and then later called it a demon, Shaitan. Now hold this for a moment. This is the first reason. The second reason is that intellection is not a bestial quality. Neither is speech. But then this thing is doing both. It's comprehending what they are saying and it is also articulating back in response. These are not bestial qualities. But they can be demonic qualities because demons have the ability of intellection and the ability of speech as well. They can speak, they can talk, they can communicate. This creature demonstrates both cognitive and linguistic abilities. These are key terms, cognition and linguistics. Remember these two terms, because I know many of the, uh, many people have interpreted the Jassasa and those interpretations can have a lot of plausibility with regards to them saying, talking about the internet or talking about technology or talking about super intelligence. What is it? Super artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence, all these other interpretives. There are many plausibilities here and I'm not sanctioning those, those theories. I'm not sanctioning them. I'm saying there are possibilities here. There are some possibilities. We have to still wait and see what transpires because there's still a process and you cannot conclude or give a conclusion on something that is still in process, right? But there is some plausibility. What we want to understand is what are the elements that are in the Hadith. That's what we want to understand. So that when the process is concluded, then we can make a universal ratification. So it has both these cognitive and linguistic abilities. It was able to cognize them, not recognize them, cognize them. Recognition entails that you've seen something before and now you see it again and you comprehend what it is. That's what recognition means. So if I say, oh, I recognize you, it means I've seen you before somewhere. Understand? That's what recognition means. If I cognize you, it means I'm seeing you for the first time, but I am comprehending you. I'm able to observe you and I'm able to comprehend you. You are a man, you've got hair, you've got a nose, you've got all these things. So this is what it's doing. It's cognizing them. It's the first time it's seen them. And it's able to understand their speech. It's able to comprehend what they're saying. They might be speaking Arabic to, to, to it, but it might not necessarily be Arab. <laughs> 
and yet it can understand its speech, their speech. Thirdly, and this is contingent on the first and second reasons, it demonstrates characteristics of maliciousness and conceit. Because what it did is it chose to deflect the question when they asked Ma Al Jasasa, what is Al Jasasa? It didn't want to tell it what it was. Rather, it redirected and turned their attention towards something else. This ability to choose whether or not to respond is also not a bestial quality. But as it attempts to cover and conceal its identity, otherwise, why would it have any issue telling them what it was? Why would it have any problem telling them what it was? Rather, it chose not to tell them. This is indicative of a demonic quality because demons do this. Demonic people do this. They try to conceal. They try to conceive. They try to change and shift about in the shadows. They are not open and apparent and evident about their actions. You see, this is a demonic quality. If you don't know what I'm talking about, what predatory qualities are, what bestial qualities are, what demonic qualities are. You remember back those who have done the, the we did the class on, on Kimya or Sa'ada, Imam Al Ghazali explains them. If you were not in the class, take a look at those lectures. Okay? You'll understand what demonic qualities are. Finally, and now we finally the fourth reason, which now goes back to the first reason. Tamima Dari's narration shows that when they first encountered it, they thought that it was a beast, a daba based on its outward appearance. But after conversing with it, through which they could now deduce more about it, they concluded it as a shaitan. This we say that it is a supposition of it being a shaitan. And it is contingent, and, all, and this is contingent on the first three reasons that we have provided here. We conclude, however, that it cannot be a beast since it is not displaying bestial qualities. Neither can it be a demon, even though it is displaying demonic qualities. Rather, Tamim Dari, his conclusion either way, as Daba first and then as Shaitan later on, is a supposition. It's not a conclusive. It's just based on what they, what they immediate, what's known in, in logic as Tasawar Asadij. They just grasped it and immediately. They didn't actually go through a process of investigation as to what it was. I mean, they started it, but they couldn't get very far. So it's what we call a tasawar asadij, just a, a, a quick comprehension, an outward comprehension of it. And this was their this, the, uh, their attempt to then change it to shaitan was closest uh, a descriptive as as they could possibly come up with tamim adari. So for these reasons, because there is now ambiguity in the terms. There's ambiguity in the terms as to what it is. We conclude that we would just simply refer to it as a creature. We refer to it as a creature. And we say that this creature's presence in the event has a role to play. And that role is defined by these two descriptives that are provided from the two terms that are provided as being monster, as a monster in its outward with demonic characteristics in it, in its inward. So it's got bestial qualities in its outward form, as its form. And it's got demonic qualities or characteristics in its inward form because they saw it in its outward, they, they concluded it was a, a daba, it was a beast. But when it spoke, and now it's when speaking is what? The Arabs say what? Al-Lisanu Tarjuman Al-Qalb. The tongue is a translator of the heart. So when you speak, your inward is being revealed. This is why they say, watch what you say. Watch what you say. <laughs> Imam Ali, they asked him, how would you know somebody? They said as soon as, he said, as soon as they open their mouth, I will know him. I'll measure him out. If he doesn't open it to his mouth, it might take me a day or two. But if he opens his mouth immediately, I'll know, I'll know exactly what kind of character I'm dealing with. So 
when when you speak the words coming out the words are reflective of your thoughts they define who you are who you are they describe who you are so when it spoke they were now able to draw a different conclusion as to its inward aspect it's behaving like a demon so it must be a demon you understand but we are calling it a creature because we don't know whether it was a daba or it was a shaitan because this is a supposition on Tamim Adari's part. They don't know. He, don't, he, they, he and the companions uh, who, who are journeying with him, they don't, they don't know who, what was what. Okay. Now we are going to move on from that and look at now what is the element of the Jassasa. The term Al Jassasa is derived from the root word of Jassasa, which means to spy. But due to its morphology, it doesn't mean the spy. This is, uh, you have to pay attention to this element here because people have called him, called it the, the spy, okay? The Jal spy. It is not a spy. And I'll explain what it is here. Even though it bears the attribute, among other characteristics, since the act of spying is done by a spy, which is an individual. The act of spying is done by, an in, by, by, by a spy, which is an individual. It seems strange to call an object a spy. And so we say that this thing, this creature is an object. It's not an animate being. It's not animate in the same way that we are animate. It's not aqili. It's ghayru aqil. Since its literal translation is availed as the spy. Okay. If you look at just the literal translation, Al Jassasa means the spy. This is why people have associated it like that. But it is not human. It's غير Aqil. It's not, it's not Aqil because Aqil is Al Hayawan Al Aqil. It's a human being. So it's غير Aqil. Even though it is animate and it is not a beast, nor a demon, even though it has qualities and attributes of both. Now, Yaqut al-Hamawi in his Mu'jam uh, al-Buldan, okay, he renders the word al-Jasasa as a synonym of the word Zughar, which means to eye. I'm eyeing you, I'm watching you, that's what, that's what it means. And it's variant of Zaghzagha, uh, which means Akhfa, uh, to like to conceal, to hide. So he says in the Mu'jam, وَجَاءَ ذَكَرَ زُغَرْ فِي حَدِيثِ الْجَسَّاسَ وَهِيَ دَابَةُ فِي جَزَائِرَ الْبَحْرِ تَتَجَسَّسُ الْأَخْبَارِ وَتَأَتِي بِهَا إِلَى الدَّجَّالِ وَتُسَمَّى دَابَةُ الْأَرْضِ وعين الزغر تغور في في آخر الزمان وهي من علامات الساعة. That the word زغر is also found in the hadith of Tamim al-Dari or in the hadith of the Jassasa. And this is the creature in the island that spies for information and then delivers that information to the Dajjal. It could also be termed as the beast of the earth. Now, there's an interesting thing here. Actually, let me finish this and I'll tell you the interesting thing. <laughs> what is this? He says that it is the watchful, penetrating eye in the last age. This is Yaqud giving his definition. It is the watchful, penetrating eye in the last age. It is also a sign of the hour. Now, the interesting thing here is that Yaqud's description of the Jasasa as Dabatul Ard is what he's saying here. Okay, where is it? Uh... What to summa Dabatul Ard. Yaqut is saying that this Jasasa is the Dabatul Ard. This is his definition. It's a truly unique interpretation. I have not seen any other scholar giving this interpretation, or maybe they are, and I haven't come across them. But the Dabatul Ard is one of the major portents of the hour, and it's always been viewed as a separate entity. But what Yaqut is saying accordingly is that. It's actually part of the same whole uh, organization. Yani, the Dabatul Ard is not entirely a separate entity by itself, an, a sign that will happen by itself. It'll actually, it's part of the Dajjalic umbrella. Just like how we have said also that Gog and Magog are also affiliated with that. 
And if you look, if you really examine the whole thing from a broad perspective, you will find that all the major signs are connected somehow. They are all connected somehow. Imam al-Mahdi is connected to the Dajjal because he's going to be part of the frontal resistance. Um, Nabi Isa is definitely connected to the Dajjal. He is the Christ. He's the Antichrist. Gog and Magog for the most part are connected as well because there is also the Sea of Galilee involved in both these parties. The Dajjal asks them about the Sea of Galilee and then he tells them it's going to dry up. And then what did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say? They are going to, they are going to drink all the water, Gog and Magog. Who's drying up the lake? It's Gog and Magog. <laughs> there is a connection. And we've also said in this regard that Gog and Magog are playing an important role in establishing that the Jalik systems, the systems that would help him. And then now we he's saying that the Dabatul Ard is, is this one. The Jasasa is Dabatul Ard. I don't know, Wallahu Alam, but it's very compelling. Now, Sheikh Imran Hussein interprets this beast, Dabatul Ard, as, as, as uh, Israel's Zionist monstrosity. That's Sheikh Imran's interpretation. Now, he's of course looking at it from a more geopolitical point of view. But it's not too far off from Yaqut's view. It's not that far off. It's very interesting because Israel and Zionism are currently the leaders, they are at the front of cyber security, of, of, of the Dajjalic establishment, that's there. But they're also leading the world in cyber security and, and, and espionage and all related technology. It's, <laughs> it's, very, that, it's Israel, all these big uh, companies, these cyber security companies, their, their headquarters and their servers and everything are established in Israel. Yeah, yeah, look it up, look it up, look it up. They want to, they, if they haven't, they want to. You'll see them on their company policies and stuff. Look up all these cybersecurity companies. They are actually established in Israel. Illegal Israel. Yes, you're right. Illegal Israel. I mean, they are, in essence, the Zionist machine is, in essence, a beast. It's a monstrosity in and of itself and completely demonic, hiding in the shadows playing with rhetoric and sophistry, collecting information for their would-be Messiah. <laughs> That's what they're doing. But both these interpretations have yet to be fully uncovered. That's what we would say. All right? Wallahu alam if it is true. Both these interpretations have yet to be uncovered. Because, but what we would say that at the moment, they are theoretically the most plausible that I've heard. Because I have heard some really strange interpretations about Dabatul Art. Something with the ears of an elephant and the nose of an ostrich and the legs of a, I don't know, rabbit and the tail of an, uh, of an alligator. I don't know how many things I've heard about this. This makes more sense to me than that one. Because if that's, I mean, if you're trying to paint me a picture about some alien, I have no idea what, what to make of that. This makes a little more sense. And there's something else also here. So let me go by this systematically. Now, Ahmed Mukhtar Omar in Mu'jam al-Lugha al-Arabiya al-Musa'ira, al-Mu'asira. He says that the uh, the variant of the word mujass, mujassa is, uh, is an ismu ala, manjassa. Ismu Allah is a noun of instrumentation. So, from the rendering that Ibn Manzur gives, he says that Jasasa is a masculine in the indefinite form, Ismu Rajul, okay, a noun that is used to refer to a man. But Jasasa with the Tamar Buta at the end becomes either the name of a female doing the act of Jasa or Jasasa. Or it becomes the name of an instrument, an object. And, and, and Ahmed Mukhtar is saying that this then becomes an ismu ala, a noun of instrumentation, like miftah, like a key. Miftah does not do the fataha. The fataha is done by an individual who uses the key. 
And miftah is not the fataha itself. Yani a key is not the opening. The key only facilitates the opening. But the act of opening cannot be done by the key. It has to be done by somebody, an animate individual who uses it as an instrument. Right? So the word conclusively refers to in the in the definite form, Al Jasasa, it conclusively refers to um, an instrument of the action that the object would be used to perform. Now it's very interesting here. I'm going to draw an ishara, okay, from the hadith. In the Arabic language, the antonym for the term jasasa is actually namasa. The Arabic, uh, the antonym for jasasa is namasa. Because what jasasa does is collects information, okay, and then gives it to somebody else. And what namasa does is acts as a confidant, a confidant to whom somebody would confide in. So the one who you confide in is somebody trustworthy. Now, would you trust a spy? You, no one trusts a spy. Nobody ever trusts a spy. <laughs> if you come to know somebody is a spy, I don't think you'll trust them. I don't think you would trust them. Now, the interesting thing is here, here in the Dajjalic propaganda, all these movies depict the spy as somebody worthy of trust. So all these action heroes, you know, James Bond, these are trustworthy people. And the, and the institutes are trustworthy institutes. So you should trust MI6. You should trust the, the, the what is it called, the NSA? The NSA. Trust the CIA. They're doing it for your benefit. They're doing it for your good. They are stopping evil for your good. Trust the spy. Trust, uh, what's his name, this guy? Uh, Ethan Hunt, right? Mission Impossible. Trust the spy. Uh, this is the Jali propaganda. So when you understand that, now you know what you're looking at. Now, the, 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 in, in the Hadith, what's interesting, when the Prophet Wasallam came down from the cave and he, and he went to his wife, she said, let's ask Waraka, because Waraka was known to be a spiritual individual, an adherent of the book. And when they went to Waraka, Waraka told him, and it's in Hadith, it's in Sahih Bukhari, so you'll see, you can read it there. Waraka told him that this, the one who came to you is An-Namus. An-Namus. He is the confidant of the passengers. He is the one who was sent to Moses. An-Namus. Who is this An-Namus? The scholars concluded that this is one of the titles of Jibreel. Now, isn't that interesting? That Jibreel alayhi salam is the Namus to whom all the messengers and prophets confide in. And he is the one sent by Allah to give them the knowledge that he reveals. And the Jasus, <laughs> the Jasasa, is someone who confides in the Dajjal. <laughs> and his information, not knowledge, his information, is in spying on people. That's how he gathers the information. He goes and gives it to the Dajjal. That's just a nishara, okay? <coughs> so they ask, the, they, they ask this thing a question. They are, what is the Jasasa? Ma al Jasasa? It didn't respond. This is what's concerning me. It didn't respond. It's behaving very strange here. You see, and, and, and they're asking, what is the jasasa? It's almost as though they've never heard of such a word. And that doesn't mean they weren't familiar with the word, with words like jasus and jasa and all that. It's just strange to hear it in that context. You see? So, because jasus is known, it means to, it means a spy. And they know that only a human being can do the spying or an animate being in the, or an aqili being, not an animate being, an aqili being. Something that, because spying requires collecting information, comprehending it and then delivering it. There's a conscious element involved. So objects cannot do spying. So this is kind of strange to them when they're, when they're, when they're watching this thing. <coughs> Now, 
Now, linguistically, we would say that a spy is a being, an intellective being, that carries out the action of spying. But in this case, the term itself does not appear uh, as, as a spy. Rather, it is being presented as a tool that would be used for spying, as an instrument. Which is why they were surprised at it. Because it's animate. It's not an object. It's an animate thing. It's talking to them. And they're like, hold on a second. If, 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 this thing must be a demon. Well, I, this is jinn. <laughs> That's what a lot of people would conclude it. Right? It's shaitan. And not just by its outward hairy or somewhat bestial uh, appearance, but by, you know, by the ambiguity and strangeness and eeriness of its speech. Yani, what it's essentially saying is that I am the spyglass. You know the spyglass? You know, you open it all white and then you look through it. That's a spyglass. It's saying I am the spyglass. Well, then that begs the question, who is the spy? If you are the instrument, who is the one wielding the instrument? Right? One of the most fascinating elements now we are talking about, remember I said what? I'm going to reference Lord of the Rings. So let's talk about Lord of the Rings. Let me read what I have written here. One of the most fascinating elements in contemporary literature is Tolkien's symbolic representation of the Antichrist as the character Sauron, whom he depicts as one who is seeking to rule the world in darkness. This character's stratagem is to deceive and entice with power, manipulating the irascibility and concupiscence of the free peoples that Tolkien has, the free peoples of Middle Earth. And so this is what Sauron is doing. In the, I'm not talking about the movies. Forget the movies. I'm talking about the literature. Read the literature. Read the book. And people have studied the literature, scholars have studied the literature and they have said that Tolkien is actually using biblical depictions in the book. And Tolkien himself said that this is, I'm going to quote what he himself said. Okay. So this is what this character was meant to do as Tolkien is depicting him. Is he's, he's trying to spread darkness by manipulating the irascibility and concupiscence of the free peoples of Middle Earth. In the story. So if you look also, like for example, the creature, uh, what is it, Gollum. Okay, if you look at this creature, you will find that he has depicted this creature as something that has completely submitted to its irascibility and concupiscence, such that it has become this horrific, horrendous creature that just desires, this is pure lust. And pure anger and pure wrath. There's nothing else this creature knows. And then yet he also depicts this creature as having some sort of humanity still there. Some trace of humanity still there that, that could be brought back out. Could be brought back out. But because it's been corrupted by the devices, which is what? The ring. The ring is what? Is a device of this character, Sauron. He's, it's been corrupted so much by these devices by this device that it's almost beyond repair. Now, if you want to draw a parallel from that and say, take this creature as a child, okay? Because to what Tolkien does is he depicts the hobbits as children. And this is what he's trying to show you how pure these children are and what these devices can do to these children. You want to draw a parallel from that. You recognize that these devices are, of the, are from the Dajjal. They're not from any other source. As we already explained, it's not from revelation. Don't assume that this is something nice and it's halal and everything. It's not about halal and haram. Which everything is not fiqh. Okay? You, everything is not fiqh. So don't apply fatwa to it. Just use your aql a little bit. These devices are from the Dajjal. Now, if you're going to put your child in front of these devices every single time, 24 hours a day. I've literally seen this. Parents just plop the iPad in front of them and that child is glued. Three, four year old child. He is buried. He can't even speak. He has not developed speech. At three, four years of age, they have not developed speech. They haven't matured as they're supposed to because everything is just there. Now what's being 
conditioned on that child. Do you think the intellect is being conditioned? No. It's the irascibility and the concupiscence of the child that's being conditioned. Yani, the, the, the shahawat, which are the lustful desires and concupiscence, and the, and the ghadabiyat, which are those raw rage and wrathful emotions, anger, bestial qualities, sorry, predatory qualities. That's what's being conditioned. And that's eventually what's going to destroy these children as they continue down that path. And you see a lot of these people, uh, eventually when they, when they become teenagers, they get involved in drugs, they get involved in crime, they get involved in all these things. There's a little bit of humanity still in them. It's still there, a little bit of humanity. It just needs to be revived. And the only thing that can revive it is purity. Anyway, I'm going off on a sidetrack, but you understand what I'm talking about, right? In his writing, <clears throat> Tolkien describes the eye of Sauron as that, understand here, as that which stands for his very person with his thoughts and emotions which he pours into this device, the ring. He's calling it the device. He defines the eye as a separate entity from the being, as Sauron's watchful and lidless gatherer of information. This is from Tolkien's writing. Okay. Now, Tolkien as I said, was a Christian. He was a devout Christian. And uh, Tolkien scholars have studied literature. Those who have studied literature have studied Tolkien's works. They said that he has actually depicted biblical elements in his stories. Now, these should be taken as metaphors and allegories. You see, this is not fact or truth. Don't go start drawing up whole new conspiracy theories about that. No, it's not fact and truth. This is just allegory. You draw an allegory that helps you. There's a moral and a story. So there's a moral and there's some virtue in the story that you can use. This is what stories are for. This is what I have also done in my other works. The Amulets of Seher, the Eye of Kibber, the Throne of Ithum and the uh, Stone of Ithir, the, the four uh, books. I have used these depictions to show you and to help you understand some of these elements because we understand through allegories. We understand through metaphors. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لِلنَّاسِ He, Allah himself presents allegories so that mankind can understand. You see, so we understand through that. So don't, but don't take that as fact. Don't take that as solid truth. We're just using this here, even in the book that I put this element here, I'm using it for demonstration purposes only. Don't say, oh yeah, Abu Bilal is, I don't know, he's now saying that uh, the Jal is Sauron. <laughs> That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> now, Yaqut al Hamawi's description of the Jasasa as the watchful penetrating eye of the last age further elaborates this 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 descriptive because the, you can only describe this thing until it's physically harder when it's manifest then maybe we'll understand it but up until now it's largely symbolic we just have to interpret and, and just give it a metaphoric description and we're trying our best to bring that metaphoric description to to it in reality as best as we can to accuracy so what did it say it directed them this act of direction is very strange. أيها القوم انطلقوا إلى هذا الرجل في الدير فإنه إلى خبركم بالأشواق. See, when they asked it, this thing, this creature, what are you? What, what is the jasasa? It didn't respond to them. Instead, it immediately redirected them somewhere else. It shifted the conversation. There are two things from here. Either it did it intentionally because it wanted to conceal itself or it seems as though it was instructed to do that. The only reason why it came all the way out there to the shore to meet them was to tell them to go to the temple because who? The man was chained. He can't leave. So it was instructed to do this. It is speaking in that manner. That it, it's not speaking of its own volition in this regard. It has been quote-unquote programmed. I'm using this word loosely. Don't say uh, this, uh, that, that this is technology in and of itself. No, we, we say these are still elements that need to be worked out. 
But I'm saying it's speaking in that in that manner. If you want to look at the language, if you want to study the linguistics of it, this is how it's speaking. Right? So note now the, the use of the terms in, in the definite sense. Adjasasa, Addair, the monastery, Arrajul, the man. Why are they using these definitive terms? Because they're referring to definitive elements. They're referring to definitive elements. This uh, Jasasa said what? That this man is waiting for you. Bil Ashwaq. Ashwaq comes from the root word Shawqa, which means to desire or to wish. It renders the meaning of something waiting with eagerness, with longing. Meaning he was ardently waiting for them. Meaning he either knew that they were coming or that he knew they were there. He either knew that they were coming or he knew that they had arrived. One of the two. Because he's locked up in the monastery. So how did he know? Well, the Jasasa informed him that there are some people who are coming. And so he must have told the Jasasa, tell them to come and see me. And so the Jasasa went there and told them to go and see him. Logic. <laughs> right? So the Jasasa was sent to usher them in. Now, read, read the rest of the disposition there. Then uh, on page 236, I have given my explanation of what is meant by the interdimensional theory. So look at that also. That also, inshallah. Now, this last piece here, and we're going to end with this. That phrase that we quoted in the first hadith, Yanzu fima bayna samai wal ard. What does that mean? The word yanzu, well, the phrase itself means, if you translate it, shifting between the samawat, between the, between the, it doesn't say samawat, it says sama, which means stratas. It means stratas and al-ard refers to the material world. So between the stratas and the physical world. Now these stratas could be hierarchical towards the samawat, but they are not the samawat themselves. So we're not talking about the heavens. These stratas, stratas in physics actually are dimensions. In physics, the word strata is dimension. Okay. So, the Wallahu Alam, the only thing I could draw from this is that he's shifting between dimensions. Now, which dimensions could these be? Al Ard is where the human being exists. That's Al Ard. Okay, that's the dimension that the human being exists in. Now, we already said that if there is a dimension where the jinn exists, and a dimension where the angels are, and a dimension where the humans are, then it's not too far off to say that there is also a dimension where the Dajjal is. Now the word Yanzu here comes from Nuzwa or Nazawa, which means to leap or to jump or to shift. It's a derivative of the word Nazza, which means to seep or to leak or to ooze, which also means, strangely so, to vibrate or to oscillate. But it, in, 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 as a technical term, it does, it's not a, it's a kind of vibration that's very erratic and unpredictable in physics. Because of another derivative of the same word, which is, uh, nuzuwiya, which means capricious or volatile or unpredictable or erratic. The literal denotation of the word vibrate in Arabic, as used as a technical term in physics in Arabic, is the word dahdaha, which means to, uh, to vibrate. And then you have dhabdaba, which means to oscillate. Now, both these terms denote vibrations and oscillations that are measured or can be measured quantitatively and predictably, whose back and forth can be, uh, is in equilibrium. It can be measured like a pendulum, right? But the oscillation of Nuzua, on the other hand, is used to describe a back and forth vibration that's completely erratic and unpredictable. 
The reason why these vibrations that are being referred to here in this statement are erratic and unpredictable from the human point of view is because the element of time between the dimensions is not the same. What transpires as a perspective of linearity, of linear time in our space, is not the same as what transpires as the perception of linearity in these other spaces. This is what we meant when we said that Einstein was right insofar as the theory of relativity is concerning physical world. Physical world, right? Physical world meaning what? The entire universe. So the Dajjal is in our universe, just like the jinn are in this universe, in this earthly universe, worldly universe, right? Because now you've got dimensions and we say that the dimensions, time, perception of time is different. Because what did we say? When we cross over physicality, it's the perception of time that's relative. Not time is not relative, time is absolute. The perception of time is relative. So the element of time between the dimensions, what transpires in linear perception of time in our three dimensional world is not the same as the linear perception of time in the, these other dimensions. The predictability of an oscillation is dependent on the initial point of, uh, of oscillation, its displaced motion to its point of, of uh, where is it? I've written it here. Its point of return. So it, 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 it starts here, it displaces across, and then it reaches here. Now it's returning back, right? And then the final destination. You have to know all these elements. You have to know what time it starts here, what time it stops here, and then what time it starts here, and what time it stops here. Then you need to know this entire distance in between and this entire distance back. Then you can measure a complete oscillation or vibration. All these variables must be known to accurately predict its oscillation. You need to know all these variables so that you can accurately predict it's going, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, it's come. You can predict that. Since our senses cannot perceive other dimensions or higher dimensions, an object oscillating between dimensions might be known in its initial point, given that that initial point is our dimension. But how long and how far it displaces into the unknown, it cannot be measured. Hence the term Nuzuwiya. Now, this theory, this is a theory, this is my theory. If you want to hold me accountable, that's okay, that's fine. You don't. You want to accept that, that's okay. You don't want to accept that, that's up to you. This is my theory. So, so this theory also explains that the Jal's first three days, like a year, like a month and like a week, which we are, we are going to examine in the next chapter. It is also why attempting to locate the physical geographical island of the Dajjal doesn't make sense because it very well might be existing in another dimension. And where is it? Another dimension, which would be his initial point of this shifting. So he's, he's shifting from there to here or, or from there to wherever between the Ard and the, sam and the sama. This also supports the theory that Tamim Dari's arrival on the island may well have been a journey across dimensions. This is another theory that this was a dimension. This is how some of the ulama then say that this was a ru'ya because it could not have happened in this world of physicality. This is something they saw in another world. And, 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 and the alam al-mithal, which is where we go when we dream in terms of the dream world, this is how it works. We are not there physically. We are there in essence. Okay. The Sama here does not mean the heavens. We've already clarified that. But we say that he's somewhere in this, in this plane of our existence. We could conclude theoretically that his location, and I'll put it in quotes here, is given by being in a realm or a dimension suspended somewhere between the material world, this material world, and the stratas, the other dimension, the stratas. We don't know how many they are. Now, mathematically, they've calculated somewhere around 11, I think. I don't know if they've calculated more than that. And, the, and you can calculate in that regard. But um, those are all theoretical as well, insofar as there being higher dimensions or more dimensions. 
But there are compelling theories and arguments in that regard that there are other dimensions. And for a Muslim, you should not negate that. Now, we're not talking about multiverse theory. There's something else as far as that is concerned, like there are multiple universes now. We're not talking about that. As a Muslim, you shouldn't negate there being other dimensions. In other words, don't look at the world egocentrically, like only from your point of view. Just what you can see is what's there. That's all that exists. No, don't look at it like that. Accept that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has created Al-A'lameen has created many worlds. And in those many worlds, he has put many other worlds. So there are many different dimensions. I mean, for example, just looking at it, insofar as the, the, the quantum realm is concerned, and it's called the quantum realm, in itself is not something you can experience or feel, but it's there, it's all around you. It's a dimension all by itself, and it has its own set of physics. <laughs> many of the laws of physics that we're accustomed to, like the laws of gravity and calculation of time, they don't work insofar as the quantum dimension is concerned. This is why it's very strange. It's a very strange realm. So we shouldn't negate them as Muslims. But we also shouldn't transgress the boundaries of interpretation in that regard. Because then we can start going into science fiction and all these things and that's not, just doesn't work. So this would explain why he has not yet physically emerged into our space and time or at the moment, the present moment of us having this lecture or having written this book. But he's somehow able to enact, uh, sorry, enact his actions and their manifestations into our world. Particularly how he is able to communicate with those who are serving him. And these servants, we said that they've, they've documented it themselves. They've said it, that they are in communication with him and he is pleased with us. You see? <laughs> Um, much in the same way that sorcerers and, and these uh, sahir, how they communicate with the jinn across dimensions. So this is a possibility and it's there. We'll leave this matter where it stands. There is more. I mean, I could, we could, I could sit and explain a lot more. I can, I'd be happy to explain the science behind you if you really want to understand dimensionality. Read my brief disposition here. And maybe that'll give you a bit of an understanding. But I am going to talk about this in much more detail in the future publications. I didn't want to get into the semantics and the details here because, again, we are laying out the foundation. So you don't lay out foundation with semantics and, and particulars. You try and establish the universals as much as you can first. That's what we are doing here. So I know it can sound a bit confusing and very far-fetched, but... Inshallah, when I get the chance and publish the rest of the material, maybe the theory will be compelling enough. And by then, who knows, a lot may have already transpired that can be used as evidential weight. Okay, you can use that as evidential weight, not as fact, but as evidential weight to support the theory. Let's end here, inshallah. We have got, what, one more chapter remaining and inshallah we'll be done with this series. Subhanaka wa bihamdika nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka anta samiyun alim wa tuba alayna ya maulana innaka anta tawabu rahim bi rahmatika ya arhamu rahimin barakallahu fikum wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh